I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Dave Gilbert, our speaker tonight. I'm going to give you a bit of a talk tonight on, uh, on one aspect only of the International Bomber Command Centre. It's such a huge project, it would be impossible to even try and cover it all in one go. Um, now, I'm uh, the losses archivist, so that's what I'm going to concentrate on this evening. I'm not going to talk about the building or, uh, or, the, um, or the exhibit or anything of that nature. I'm solely going to concentrate on the, on the losses. Um, and really that all centres around this picture you can see in front of you there, which is the, uh, the spire and the memorial walls. Because the first part of this exercise was to create the, uh, the list of names for the memorial walls. Um, hopefully you've all at least seen the, uh, the spire, um, even if only in the distance. Um, and for those of you who haven't yet been, if I can uh, maybe uh, uh, interest you in going along when it's permitted, of course, which it isn't at the moment, then um, I'm sure, absolutely certain, that you will find it a very uh, enjoyable and moving experience. So hopefully this will whet your appetite a little bit. So um, you've probably seen the figures or, uh, already. There are 57,861 names on the memorial walls that surround the, uh, the spire at IBCC. And I think it's important that we, uh, first of all, get a sense for how many people that really is because it's just a number if, you, if, if, if you're not careful. And uh, so I think this picture, um, which always strikes people as, as being a, an odd first slide perhaps, is, uh, is intended to put it into context. Uh, so uh, this is the Emirates Stadium and its, uh, its capacity is about 300 more people than there are names on the IBCC memorial walls. So every person you see in front of you there is represented by one name. It's, um, I think it's a very sobering thing when you see that quantity of people um, and uh, actually will surpass that number uh, very soon because we haven't yet got the memorial walls in place for the pre-war and post-war losses and they will actually just tip the balance over the number you see in front of you there. Um, and just to put it into stark contrast, contrast, I've also got a slide of it empty. So, you know, there, there's the contrast. Um, to go from a, a stadium full of people to there being none. And, and really that's, I think, as, puts it in a nutshell as well as anything I possibly could as to the sheer magnitude of losses that, that are represented up there. So what I'm gonna talk about in the rest of the talk is, uh, is, is the process I went through of gathering all those names, and, uh, which is a very much an ongoing process. It's by no means over. Um, so, first of all, why on earth am I involved in this? Uh, well, I have no RAF background, that's the first thing. My dad did, did national service in the RAF, but apart from that, I'm not from a forces family at all. And the story of how I became involved is that um, uh, in 2009, uh, my company won the Queen's Award for export. And uh, the, the, um, the award takes two Two, two different uh, aspects. One is you go down to, to, uh, to London to meet the Queen, which we did. And the other one is you, you organize a local ceremony and the Lord Lieutenant comes along and presents you a glass bowl. And you do it your way. You can have it where you want. Some people have it in their premises, others don't. We had it in the chapter house in the cathedral. Um, and, uh, and that's where you receive your glass bowl. And if you look at the picture at the top there, you'll see there's me and my wife receiving the bowl. Uh, from Tony Worth, who was at the time the Lord Lieutenant. And um, that, although I didn't realise it, was the start of all of this, um, because Tony worked, sadly, as you probably know, Tony is no longer with us, uh, but he worked in a very different way to most Lord Lieutenants. Ordinarily, when he went to, a, to a, 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 an event like that, um, uh, most Lord Lieutenants would give you a list, rather like when a mayor opens a fate, um, of the charities that they're supporting in the hope that you'd make a donation. But Tony never did that. What he did instead was to write your name in his little black book. And then at some point in the future, you'd be invited to some kind of event that would uh, uh, hopefully get you uh, involved. And, and that's exactly what happened because, um, I mean, I, I kept in touch with him anyway, uh, having not, never met him before. And, um, um, he actually got me involved in, uh, in, in uh, a committee at the cathedral, so, so we met regularly. But he invited me to the launch event of uh, what was then the Lincolnshire Bomber Command Memorial, uh, which was 
lunch under the wings of a Lancaster. Well, who was going to refuse? Uh, well, actually, I almost did uh, because I was so busy. I actually phoned the number on the invitation and said, I'm really not sure I should be coming. Um, and, you know, it's, it, this is clearly for the great and the good, and I'm neither of those things. Uh, so um, I probably shouldn't come. And uh, the, the lady who answered the uh, phone, who is now the chief, chief executive, Nikki van der Drift, said, you should go. Uh, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. And uh, so it turned out. And what happened was I, I, I listened to the, to the architects uh, describing how they were going to take the names out of the cathedral rolls of honour, uh, which you may have seen, the, the, um, uh, there's three books in the Airman's Chapel. Um, and they were going to put them on, uh, actually at the time, they were going to put them on the spire itself, which was a bad idea. And everybody eventually realised that it turned the thing into a tin whistle and it would uh, howl something chronic in the wind. Uh, and I was very relieved anyway, because it was, a, it was just the wrong way of doing it. Uh, so instead, the, the plan was to put them on uh, a series of walls that surrounded the spire. And the spire would be solid. Now, I listened to all of this, and, uh, and, 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 and I wondered to myself exactly how they were going to do that. Because I'd seen the books in the cathedral, and uh, they were um, sort of, they're all written in copper plate, very difficult to read. They're huge leather tomes anyway. Um, and, um, and after the event, I went along to Tony and I said, well, thanks for the invitation. I'm not really sure how I can help. But out of interest, how are you going to get the names from the one to the other? Because you clearly need them in some kind of digital format now. And um, if, if any of you ever met Tony, you'll know that he had a bit of a twinkle in his eye and, and, and away with words. And he looked at me and he said, Dave, I've got no bloody idea. Have you? And that's really where the whole thing started because as, a, as an engineer, I'm an electronic engineer by, by profession, I figured I did know and, uh, and so I volunteered. And um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, but it started in a fairly humble way of, you know, the task really was just to, to copy out the names and not necessarily any more than that, literally just the names um, out of the three books in the, uh, in the cathedral. Um, now, I wasn't able to, to remove them. They're absolutely not allowed. Um, nor was I allowed to photocopy them. In any case, they're too big for that. So what I had to do was photograph them page by page. And I did it in one of the vestments, uh, which took several, several weeks. Um, you know, not necessarily every day, but, uh, but there's, there's a lot of it. Um, but... It's important to say these were just the Lincolnshire losses because, well, I'll come into a little bit more detail on it, but it's predominantly Lincolnshire losses. And because it was the Lincolnshire Bomber Command Centre at the time, that's as far as we, we, uh, we had any kind of remit. And um, I suppose we all had an aspiration to do more than that, to get the whole thing, but there was not necessarily going to be the money available for it, etc. So, you know, at the time it was capturing the names in Cathedral, of which there are just over 26,000. So it was a fairly mechanical process. I reckon it would take six or seven months and, and, it, and it did. It was, it, was, it was about spot on. Um, and um, once I've got them captured, and, and by the way, the three books have got quite different information in them. Um, some have got squadron numbers, some haven't. Some have got service numbers, some haven't. Um, etc. So it was all a bit disparate and, and it, it wasn't it wasn't an easy task just reading the darn things because copper plate is you know F's look like S's and, and, and vice versa. It's, very, it's really quite quite a difficult exercise but it was a mechanical exercise just going through them one by one um, and, um, and and there was no I didn't really feel any great connection with them at the time uh, because I was you know I was under time pressure I needed to get it done um, and having got it done, um, and, and uh, as I was doing it, by the way, my parents were proofreading to make sure that I hadn't made any typing errors, which of course I did along the way, and, and they got corrected. They'd actually been proofread three times by the time I'd got it all done. Um, but for all that, a light went on in my, had, in my head, and I'm very glad it did, that said, well, who's to say they were accurate in the first place? So what I did was I took, um, I took, 500 names out of the 26,000 entirely at random and um, I, I, I flushed them all through the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website 
just to see that they all concurred. And they didn't, not by a long, long way. Um, and actually I worked out about 15% of them were in error, but in one way or another, there was a wrong initial or the name was spelt wrong or the date of death was wrong. There was something wrong along the, line, along the lines. The one group book was the worst. And by the way, one group is all of the airfields that were um, north of where I am in Welton. Um, so um, um, actually not including Scampton. Everything north of Scampton, let's say, was is one group. Everything from Scampton south is five group. One group was particularly bad. I have no idea why. Five group wasn't quite so bad. Um, so, um, and I was getting really close to the to the wire now on, on having to give this to the uh, to the architects. So, so, dear God, what am I going to do? Um, and uh, another light bulb moment was that I contacted BBC Radio Lincolnshire. And they really stepped up to the plate and helped me in a massive, massive way. Um, so uh, they gave me a slot on the mid-morning show so I could appeal for volunteers to help me unpick the mess. Um, and um, uh, we were literally inundated. Um, and this was the first time we'd actually called for volunteers to help with anything. Um, and, um, and for those of you who are, have some familiarity with IBCC, you'll know that it is it's fueled almost entirely by volunteers. Uh, there are, I think, something like 600 volunteers signed up, uh, but this was the beginning of the, of the whole volunteer uh, thing. And um, I remember as I, as I left the studio, um, uh, ha having done my bit, um, the receptionist said to me, go and sit by that phone and pick the, pick the calls up that I patched through to you because I can't cope. She said, I've never known such a response before, um, which I think shows a lot about how deep this runs in, in Lincolnshire. Um, and that day we signed up 92 volunteers. And, we, and, and I know we lost some because, you know, the, the, there was such a backlog on the, on the switchboard that we inevitably lost some. Uh, so it was, um, it was quite a day. And uh, we got our, I got my 90 volunteers, which is what I needed. Um, without without really trying that hard, actually, just that one uh, radio uh, appearance was enough. And what I then did was to to carve all the names up into blocks of three hundred, and each one of them got a block of three hundred. And their, what they were tasked with was checking them, putting them into the War Graves Commission, and checking they were right. And if they weren't, uh, giving me um, not not changing it, but giving me the heads up on what was wrong, so that I could figure out which was right and which was wrong and, and correct as necessary. Um, but if, if any of you have been on the War Graves Commission website, you'll know that there's quite a lot more information in there. Uh, for example, there's sometimes next of kin information, there's sometimes their age um, and so on. So, and I said, well, actually, while you're there, do us a favor and transfer any information that they've got into the spreadsheet, um, which they all did. And um, that was really a turning point in the whole project because rather than being just a list of names to allow us to make the memorial walls, it then started to become something quite different. It began, began to be a database of its own. And, um, and I very, very quickly realized that we could really create something here that was, um, that was really cutting edge that nobody else had because we could include all the operational information, for example, what aircraft they were on, um, uh, why they were attacking that night, what happened, uh, what the serial number of the aircraft, the takeoff station, all of this stuff, as well as, ne as next of kin, as well as their ages, uh, etc. It could just roll on and on forever. And, 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 and that was really a, a turning point in the whole project for me. Um, so in a way, I'm actually very, very glad that we had this this uh, sort of real panic moment where we had to get these volunteers because otherwise, literally, it may never have, never have happened. It may have been never any more than just a list of names. So I appreciate you're not going to be able to read this, uh, but just to give you an idea as to the level of information that we now have on um, on your average airman on, on the database, this is 
one just one single person within the name within the list of names of which by the way there are 57,861 and um, so you can see there's sort of 40 50 pieces of information about each one and um, it's at, since I screen grabbed this it's actually grown quite a bit and um, I mean for example we've got personal information at the top name gender age and that sort of thing um, date of death um, next of kin, uh, etc. We've then got the aircraft information they're on, the memorial, where they're buried, what grave number, and, and so on. Um, we've got uh, enlistment information, so service number, which service they were with, because of course many of them were uh, were not British uh, uh, subjects. They were Canadians, they were uh, Australians and New Zealanders, South Africans. Um, and, and, and many, many more countries as well. There are over 60 countries in, in, involved in, in, all, in all, and um, not all Commonwealth countries either. So places like Norway, Belgium, that sort of thing, um, all had a, a contingent. And of course, Poland had quite a, quite a significant contingent. It's kind of interesting type in their names, isn't it, I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so I just want to give you a feel for how much information we've now got. And there's actually one glaring omission, which uh, which I'll spot a mile away, but um, uh, but I appreciate you can't read. Um, uh, uh, it's actually amongst the memorial information because um, during lockdown, I had a big, big crowdsourcing project uh, to um, to capture all of their epitaphs. Um, or grave, grave, gravestone inscriptions, and actually 30,000 of them have got gravestone inscriptions of, of, of one form or another. Um, not all have, because of course the ones that are on Running Mead, for example, that's that's um, it, it's impossible. It's not they're not gravestones. It's it's just a, a, a series of um, a, of stone tablets, uh, so they couldn't possibly have a, 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 an epitaph, but. Uh, those that have, we have now captured, and there's some incredible ones. It's been a, a fantastic project to capture all of those. Um, uh, one of the best projects I've ever run, without a shadow of a doubt, and, and all the volunteers loved doing it because there were su such fascinating ones amongst them. Um, there was all sorts of stuff in there. There were ones in foreign languages, there were um, you know, literary quotes, there were um, school mottos, um, and some really, really um, poignant ones, um, incredible. So it's when you go on there and, and actually get a copy that you can you can actually read, uh, then um, do look out for, I'll show you with a pointer, it's just there um, where there is one. It's um, just under the grave reference, you'll see that. And we have added some interpretation to them where, um, where it's been possible to. So if it's a literary quote, we'll say what, poem it's from or what book it's from or whatever if it's in a foreign language there's the translation and so on so so you know that really very unique nobody else has, has got anything uh, remotely close to that uh, so uh, yeah great great uh, uh, part of the project that has been so um let, let's talk about numbers a little bit um i'm not going to i'm not going to do statistics don't worry um, so I've already given you the number of 57,861. Now, if you have a look at the memorial in Green Park to Bomber Command, you'll see that that quote's quite a different number. It's 55,573. So why the difference? Well, uh, because we are way more inclusive. Uh, so this is a list of uh, who I've included in that, uh, in that list, um, in our list. And uh, obviously at the top, um, and lost on ops and training and and the same is true of uh, of green park so so in that in that respect we concur um airmen on loan or detachment now it's not clear whether uh, whether green park have included included those or not um so long as they didn't transfer permanently out i include them so if they go on loan to coastal command for example then i'll put them in um, specialist operators, I imagine, were in the, uh, uh, the, the Green Park Memorial. So when, when I speak of those, what I'm talking about is, uh, is usually an eighth man in the, uh, in, in the heavy bombers um, who was a specialist radio operator. Uh, they had a thing called uh, ABC, Air Airborne Cigar, and uh, 101 Squadron Lud Ludford Magna were big on this. 
uh, and the purpose was that they, they, they weren't involved in dropping bombs on the hull. Uh, they were, they were, um, they, they had a role a little bit like the AWACS does now in that they would fly above the, uh, the uh, bomber stream and uh, they would tend to circle around the, the target area. And their purpose was to give um, radio commands to the night fighters, incorrect ones, in German. So to be credible, they really needed to be native German speakers. Um, and they were a very, very interesting bunch of people, these were. Um, it was highly, highly secret, to the point where the planes, when they were on the ground, had an armed guard, each one. Um, and um, a lot of them were, in, because they were, they, were, they were fluent German speakers, a lot of them were of German extraction, but Canadians. Um, was, uh, Canada at the time was a real melting pot, actually, and uh, there were a lot of, uh, of, of Germans living there, sort of first generation Germans. And uh, that was a rich seam of, of, of fluent German speakers that the, uh, that the forces could tap into. Um, but also there were quite a number of, of uh, German speaking Jews amongst them. Um, so, you know, it really does make for some interesting reading, the specialist operators, but we do include them. Um, we also, and this is a really contentious one, we include ground crew um, and hallelujah for that because Green Park do not. Um, and uh, it was extremely contentious when the Green Park Memorial opened. There was a lot of ill feeling amongst the air crew because they knew that, um, well, that the, the old adage is that the, uh, the, the aircraft belonged to the ground crew and they would loan it to the air crew for the night. Um, uh, but the, 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 the air crew quickly learned, uh, you know, not to, um, uh, to disrespect the, the ground crew because, uh, you know, they were completely dependent on the serviceability of that aircraft and uh, they were as important as the air crew, no doubt about it. And uh, so it's very understandable why it caused such angst at, uh, at the Green Park opening ceremony. So we do include them, uh, but I don't have them all. I wish I did. Um, it will take forever to get all of them. Uh, they weren't documented, uh, like, not in the way that the air crews were. So I, I, it's a constant battle for me to try and add more. And we have a couple of panels where we can add more names as, as time, time goes by. Um, and they're, they're, they're made in a slightly different way. I'll say a bit about that in a minute. Um, we also uh, include ones that uh, either died or were killed on active service. You know, some were not necessarily service related. There were natural causes or they were caught up in, uh, in air raids while on leave, all sorts of things, all sorts of weird things as well. One, believe it or not, was even killed on a tandem. Uh, so they all go in. If they were on the strength of Bomber Command, they, they go in, end of story. Um, we also include POWs that died in captivity who were originally on the strength of Bomber Command before they were shot down, uh, which again, Green Park do not. Um, but perhaps the most interesting thing actually is this last category, passengers. Um, so just to, uh, to look at the, just quick run down those, cadets. Um, these were, uh, and there's a very tragic case of uh, a, um, uh, a young lad of 14, would you believe, is the youngest name on the, on the walls. Uh, he was a cadet um, and he was given the opportunity of an air experience flight from RAF Elsham Walls, if I remember correctly. Um, and the aircraft developed problems and crashed and with the loss of, of all of the crew and both the cadets that were on it. Uh, very tragic case. Um, other service personnel, they often had Navy uh, personnel on board when they were, when they were dropping um, uh, mines, uh, gardening as they called it. Uh, so that wasn't at all uncommon. Uh, special agents. Now, this is an, a, a little known aspect of, of Bomber Command is that they had uh, that um, the Special Operations Executive, SOE, they did not have aircraft of their own. They relied on Bomber Command to, uh, to, to, to drop um, both agents and uh, supplies behind enemy lines. Um, I mean, it really is James Bond stuff, this, and uh, I'm writing a book at the moment. It's got a fair, fair amount of, uh, of uh, special agent stuff in, and it's always fascinating. It's extremely difficult to research, though, because it was so secret that they didn't keep records. Um, and uh, that, that, that means that the only thing there is is, um, uh, is sort of um, um, post-war 
um, accounts in, in biographies and that kind of thing. But even that was governed by the Official Secrets Act, so extremely difficult to research. And then there's all sorts of others in there as well, like meteorologists, news reporters. There was one night on a, a raid on Berlin when three news re uh, reporters were killed on, on in, in each in separate aircraft. Um, and also repatriation flights after the war. Uh, some, obviously they weren't getting shot down by then, uh, but they were either perhaps getting caught up in weather or they developed uh, mechanical problems. So not only do we include the crew in that case, we also include the passengers. And that's where, where you get lots and lots of uh, personnel who weren't with Bomber Command. But they were on a Bomber Command aircraft when they were killed, so we include them. Uh, who's not in, uh, although we have plans to, to, to do so, is um, the Mediterranean, Middle East and North African squadrons. I mean, a lot of people think that Bomber Command is any squadron that, that flew bombers. Absolutely not. Um, Bomber Command flew only from this country, except in, in extreme circumstances like British, British Expeditionary Force before the fall of France. But otherwise, they only flew uh, from this country. Um, so any squadron that was based in the Med is not Bomber Command. But that doesn't mean to say we haven't got aspirations of including them. We absolutely do, and I'm on with it right now. And the other one is the second tact tactical air force, because that was a sort of a split off, or partly a split off from Bomber Command. So that's going to go in as well. And um, we do already have, uh, we hope at least, uh, a donor for the uh, for the cost of putting up the walls, which is not inconsiderable. Uh, the ones that are already there cost uh, some, some, something like four hundred thousand pounds to put up. Uh, so um, you know we can't do it without sponsorship, but um, we we believe we have that. Now, why be so inclusive? Well, simply because that's where a lot of the interesting stories lie, um, and I'll tell you a few uh, a few of those stories in a bit. Before I do, let's talk a little bit about uh, um, how these walls are actually manufactured. So having got the, um, uh, my list of names, um, and in the first phase that was, as I said, about 26,000, and, and in the final event, once we'd done the whole of Bomber Command, um, just shy of 58,000. Um, so I provide the list to a, a graphic designer who does the typesetting. And just to say a little bit about the typesetting, if you look to the right of the flow diagram here, you'll see um, how the names are arranged. So it's basically surname first, and then up to three initials. Uh, believe it or not, some of the uh, airmen had six initials, but we only ever include three. Um, and you also see, if you look down here, Danes AH465. So what's the number all about? Well, uh, there's actually two Danes AHs, and we need to be able to differentiate between them because um, if you're a visiting family member and you want to pay your respects to, uh, uh, to, to your loved one, then obviously you want to know exactly which is their name. Uh, so having two identical names is really not on at all. And just to give you an idea, there are 27 J Smiths. Uh, so we differentiate between them in the same way that the military themselves do, which is to put the last three digits of their service number after their name. So that's what the 465 is all about. But would you believe it, even that was duplicated on two, on two occasions. So it, uh, was, I can't even remember where they are, but, uh, but there are two instances where we had to go to four digits to get them to be unique. Uh, so, um, and also the, the, the dot between each name, um, which is a whole, um, was really only there to delineate each name from the next, so that you knew that it, this, this one here, for example, was Dabson CC and not CC Dacey. That's why we needed the dot. Uh, but it's coming extremely useful. It was never planned. It was extremely useful for putting a poppy in. Um, it's absolutely perfect for the job. <laughs> and uh, if you go up there at the moment, you'll see it's a sea of poppies. Um, so that's that's what the uh, the graphic designer did. I didn't do that bit. Um, and then having got each panel graphically designed, uh, then that w went. Then each of those files. And by the way, there are two hundred and seventy one walls at the moment. Uh, each of those went off for laser cutting, which was done in Lincoln by uh, Micrometric on Doddington Road. 
Um, and I actually went along and watched some of them being cut, which was uh, very, very interesting. Amazing thing is that I'll show you a video of it in a moment, um, that you can actually uh, watch this happening. And, and I said, you know, what happens if there's a reflection? Do I get blinded or do I get cut in half? And they said, no, it will have absolutely no effect on you whatsoever because the light that they use is, um, uh, is not absorbed by flesh. So they said the worst that would happen is if you caught it in, the, in caught sight of it with your eye, your eye would feel a little bit warm and you just look away. Uh, but it won't do you any, any, any significant harm. I expected it to be sort of uh, locked away where you couldn't possibly see it, but now you can just stand there and watch, and I did. Uh, and I took some footage which I'll show you. Um, so and that, that's the really hard part of the process, actually. Uh, it's, the, it's the vast majority of the process. After that, there's fettling, which is just cleaning it up, and then de-stressing. De-stressing was done by Siemens. Now, Siemens is a big company, but also a German company. So there was a limit to how much we'll support we were going to get from them, politically speaking. Uh, so they did, they did help us as much as they dare. Uh, and the de-stressing was all about uh, making sure that the panels didn't crack because the laser cutting process, very, very fast though it is, creates heat. And um, the, the fear was that it would put some stresses into the metal that might subsequently turn into cracks and particularly coming out from the corners of a letter. And it's, this could be a latent defect that would appear 20, 50, 100 years from now and absolutely ruin the, the, the panels. Uh, so the way around it is to, is to uh, slowly heat up the, the panels to about 600 degrees C and leave them soaking in that temperature for, I think it's 48 hours or something. And that gets rid of all the stresses. So Siemens did that. And then they had to be rolled because these are circular sections of wall that surround the spire. So they have to be rolled either concave or convex, depending on which side of the wall they're going to go on. And again, you'll see it happening in a minute. Um, and Hindles did that. Again, all in Lincoln. Um, and uh, the, the only bit that wasn't done was actually um, making the, um, uh, the steel itself, which is, wasn't done in Scunthorpe either. Uh, it was, uh, it, it's, it's caught end steel and it's only made in the northeast. So that, that aspect of it wasn't done in Lincolnshire. All the rest was. So let's show you a video. Um, so hopefully this is going to run. I have had problems with this in the past. There we go. So you see it cutting each and every letter. And you see how fast it is. It will do a letter in a couple of seconds. But also, notice how it doesn't do it as you would write it. And the reason for that is because of the distribution of heat. If you allowed it to happen um, as you would write it, it would heat up too much in one area. And, and it would actually um, distort the metal too much. So this is just cleaning it up, getting rid of any swarf that's in there. Now this is the rolling process, and you need to decide which way round it's going to go so that you can get either a convex or a concave panel. And there you are, that's, that's the finished panel that would go off to be de-stressed now. Notice it just looks like mild steel when, uh, uh, when it's new. Um, it's not until it gets outside it starts to develop the, uh, uh, char that characteristic uh, appearance. Um, and by the way, the core material is the same stuff as the Angel of the North is made from. Um, and and when, it's, when it's weathered, it's not actually rust that's in there. It's, it's, uh, the material's got a very high copper content and that's what gives it that kind of ruddy uh, appearance. It's something akin to rust, but it isn't rust. It never would go into, for example, deep battleship type, type rust. That, that can't happen uh, because the, the, sort of, uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, passenger that it gets on it actually protects it 
stops it going any further. So uh, it's really quite different to rust. It doesn't come off in your hand or anything like that. But the thing I find actually most most poignant is at, at sunset uh, when when the whole the whole spiral walls are, are lit by late evening sun because. Um, they're kind of orange anyway, and then the, the red light of, sun, of sunset really makes it glow. And, and the poignancy for me is that that's exactly the time when they would have been uh, setting out for a bombing run. Okay, so this was, uh, this was me putting in the last bolt. Uh, so this is the end of phase one. I can tell that because that is panel number 120. And that's as far as phase one went. So that's the end of the, uh, of the linkage losses. And then phase two was panel one to one onwards and was all of the non-linkage losses. Um, I say that it's actually not quite true what I've just said, because um, to be right about this, the phase one was all of the losses that are in the cathedral. And that's actually a bit more than linkage losses because the third book is uh, the um, operational training units and heavy conversion units, the training units in other words. And uh, they, that book for the entirety of, of, uh, of Bomber Command is in Lincoln, even though hardly any of the losses were incurred in Lincoln. And the reason it's there, you can only speculate on, but being a yellow belly, my opinion is that well, it's the spiritual hold of home of Bomb Command, so where else would it be? Um, but um, the reason that there were very, very few losses, uh, train losses in Lincolnshire is twofold. First of all, don't go mixing training squadrons with operational squadrons. They'll only bump into one another. Uh, so that the, 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 there were one or two. Blyton was a training uh, uh, squad, uh, was a training base. Um, RF Santoff didn't operate for very long. That was too in, up in northern Lincolnshire. Um, but by and large, they weren't in Lincolnshire. The other reason was that um, the, the Germans got quite good at, um, at sending uh, intruder fighter aircraft over to pick off um, um, rookie crews before they could become operational. So putting them on the east coast was, again, not a very good idea. So training squadrons tended to be either inland or out west. But they're all in that third book, which is in Lincoln Cathedral. So they're also in phase one. Phase two is everything else. Um, that's my parents, by the way. They came along to this uh, ceremony where I put in the last bolt. Um, and, um, and by the way, if you ever go up to the centre, and I hope you do, then um, you will see that um, as, as you approach the, uh, the, the memorial walls, you'll see on your right hand side a half width panel. That's on one side, as you, the, the side you approach from, um, it says because we remember. So I, I refer to it as the, tot as, as the totem panel. And um, on the other side, it's got panel 271, which w is where I add those additional names. It's only half width, that one. And if you look, you'll see that there's a bolt missing from that. And the reason it's missing is because when I came to put it in, I couldn't. Um, not because it wouldn't fit, <laughs> but because I knew that, un unlike with phase one, where I'm very proud and honored to, to, uh, uh, to have been asked to put the, the last bolt in, if I put the last bolt in phase two, then I'd have finished. And this job is never finished, and it can never be allowed to be finished. So symbolically, I left it out, and it, I keep it here. And uh, when, when I'm too old to do this job anymore, then I'll pass it on to the next boss's archivist, and hopefully he or she will take the same view as I do. But so long as I, so long as I'm involved, that bolt isn't going in. So. Bit of an interlude, bit of a photographic interlude now. Uh, I'm just going to show you a few pictures around the place, um, and I've credited them, credited them where I uh, know who took them. Um, so obviously a view at sunset uh, and detail. Notice in that picture, by the way, for the uh, for the spire, you can see uh, holes in the middle of it. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in that uh, in, in that spire. First of all, it's 102 feet tall, which is the same as the wingspan of a Lancaster. Its width of the bottom is 12 feet, which is the same as the wing root of a Lancaster. 
but uh, th those holes that you can see in between the two nested wing fragments um, are reminiscent of the way in which your wing are constructed um, and, and that's really quite deliberate. The other thing that's very deliberate is the exact position of the spire and this is the view if you stand in between the two uh, nested fragments because it exactly frames the cathedral and that's it was iconic for the for the airmen because it was um, the last thing that many of them would have seen as a recognizable landmark before they uh, flew out over the sea uh, never to return and uh, that doesn't just apply to the Lincolnshire uh, losses either because uh, the Yorkshire uh, uh, squadrons would often fly out over Lincolnshire in order to get to the coast so it was just as iconic for them in actual fact um, but um, it was also the first thing that they would see uh, for those crews that were lucky enough to to come back um, and they could see it uh, from altitude they could see it from uh, before they'd made landfall and once they saw it they they would be reasonably sure they were safe and that they could chalk off another one of their 30 ops which by the way they stood about a three percent chance of uh, of completing uh, just to put some statistics to it this is my favorite picture of the uh, of the center i just love this one um, I, the black and white really here yeah, is, is is extremely powerful and that's a a, a view of the of the of the center uh, we, it's very modern um, as you will see it's uh, it's not we, we didn't want to create something that was stuck in the past and it, and it absolutely isn't it's a very modern digital center uh, and um, it's also not about it's not a museum um, you won't find uh, in, in in the words of Tony Worth you won't find any bits of bent tin uh, because that's not what we're about it's not about the aircraft it's about the people it's about the ones that, that perished and it's about the ones that survived and telling their stories so it's a very human thing uh, it's quite iconic that one I think the the, uh, the Battle of Britain Memorial uh, flight quite quite like flying over it and they seem to do it quite regularly which we're very happy about um, that was taken on the uh, on, at the unveiling ceremony as opposed to the opening ceremony um, the uh, it was a beautiful day unlike the opening ceremony which was an absolutely terrible day weatherwise um, and uh, you, you, you can tell that it was at the unveiling but look how the the panels haven't really developed their patina yet uh, they look still look like mild steel in places we were actually going around the day before spraying them with empty windoline bottles the squeak you know the, uh, the, the the trigger ones to try and rust them up more quickly <laughs> it was only of a limited success to be fair but uh, but it, it did improve them a little bit uh, another one uh, we did get some really good fly pass on the uh, at the unveiling ceremony but not at the opening ceremony because the cloud base was about 50 feet <laughs> we didn't get any fly pass at all at that and again another one of my favorites uh, taken from a drone fantastic picture that one that's yeah, nice isn't it okay so um depending on how long you want me to talk i'll, I'll um and i didn't ask that question i'm sorry um I'll, I'll either skim through this these quickly or i'll take my time over them a little bit how long do you want me to talk <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know like another 10 15 minutes okay fair enough so we'll whiz through them then in that case so these uh as i say there are just a few of the stories i've discovered along the way and uh we'll have to whisk through them a bit but um this one uh I, I, if, if anybody's been following the uh, the Days of Remembrance uh, spot on the IBCC Facebook page, it was me that wrote those, and this was this was the first one that uh, that I featured. Um, so the pilot's prerogative. Now the, the the misconception that many people have, understandably, is that the rear gunner was the uh, was the um, riskiest trade and the most likely to perish, but it's not true. The pilot was the most likely to perish and and the answer for it is very very straightforward and it's because he was the captain of his ship and uh, he was responsible for all the souls on board and they would invariably do their best to keep a stricken aircraft straight and level to give the rest of the crew enough time to to bail out and in 
in so doing often denied themselves the, uh, the, 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 the luxury of doing the same and uh, they would go down with their aircraft sadly. And uh, this was one such example. Uh, he was a Canadian, I can tell that by the J in the slash. Uh, so whenever you see that, it's either an R a slash or a J in a slash, that's a Canadian. Um, and he was on a training uh, flight. Um, he was based at um, RAF Middleton St. George, which is now Teesside Airport. And he was, um, he was on a training sortie. It was towards the end of the war, it's January 1945. And it was about 15 minutes from base uh, and he was flying over, gosh, where was he flying over? Darlington. And uh, they developed um, uh, significant problems with the, uh, with the engines and he knew he couldn't make it back to base. Um, so he told his crew to bail out, um, which they all obliged. And um, he also knew that he wasn't going to be able to clear the houses before it crashed. So he decided he'd stay with the aircraft. Uh, and incredible, um, and 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 sadly never never decorated, and 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 never would have been decorated either because they were never they never were on training uh, flights. They were only ever decorated on uh, on operational flights, and in any case, a lot of the awards couldn't be made posthumously. So DFC, DFM, for example, never made posthumously. Um, VCs were. Uh, but uh, and, and and a couple of the other uh, very high uh, uh, honours, but but not it might perhaps you would think get a DFC, but sadly not. Um, so he stayed at the controls and he actually yelled to the last man to leave. Um, and I quote: uh, "The it's only me for it. There's thousands down there." So there was no doubt as to what he was doing. He knew darn well he was going to perish with the with the aircraft. Um, and um, they named a street after him, and it's still named after him to this day, McMullen Road. And uh, they, they had a, a, a whip round uh, around the town, and they, they raised a lot of money, and they tried to send it home to his family, but were unable to, um, because they refused it. And they said it was, uh, could be put to better use in war-torn England. Uh, so they instead used it to uh, to open two new beds in the, uh, in the children's ward in Darlington uh, Hospital. And his sister, who was stationed here as well with the Red Cross, actually opened and de dedicated the beds. So just to give you an example of the, of the bravery that these guys showed, it's just incredible. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that just to dispel the myth, it's not the rear gunner that was uh, the, mo the, the most likely to die. It was... Uh, Apart from in a, um, a uh, Mosquito, where it's a very different crew arrangement, uh, it's true in every aircraft that I've, uh, I've, I've measured it for, which is actually most of them. So, um, I'll, I'll skip this one, except to say that um, I, was, I was sitting at, at my mum's house uh, a while ago, and, and I mentioned a while ago, I'm writing a book, and this picture on the right-hand side here of a rear gunner is going to be the cover. And um, I was busy writing it. And um, I, the reason I was at my mum's is, unfortunately, she's got dementia. And uh, her carer came in and said, that's my dad. And I couldn't, I could not believe it. She said, yeah, he was, he was 19 at the time. I've seen that picture before. We used to have it on our wall. And uh, so I was, galvanised me even more to include him uh, as, as, as the cover of my book. So amazing coincidence. There you go. Um, now this story, Brothers in Arms. In incredibly, there were six sets of brothers all killed on the same day. And I, and I first spotted this coincidentally as I was typing in the names in the first place. You know, you type in a name like Kirkham. That's not, that's not a common name. And, and then, uh, you know, 10 minutes later, you type in Kirkham again, and you think, oh, that's a duplicate, I'll go back and check. And then you realize that actually, same surname, different initials. Then you add the next of kin, and you realize that they're brothers. And incredibly, it happened on six occasions. I've only got four of them listed here. Um, they weren't necessarily um, on different aircraft. The Kirkham brothers were, um, one was flying from just over, over here, 100 yards away, at RAF Dunholm Lodge. Um, and the other one was flying from, I think, Skipton-on-Swale in, in Yorkshire. 
but they happened coincidentally to be on the same uh, same mission that night and uh, both aircraft were lost. So imagine uh, the mother would have received two telegrams that next day. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, some of the others though were on the same aircraft and that was strictly against the rules. But um, I think on, on in certain uh, instances, it was uh, kind of waved through, let's say. Um, the, the Todd twins certainly, because they, they actually said to their commanding officer, um, we want to be on the same, same aircraft because we can't function without one another. We think they were identical twins, but I have, have yet to prove that beyond, beyond doubt. Uh, but that sounds like the kind of thing that identical twins would, uh, would perhaps say. And, um, and, and unfortunately, that is just how it worked out. Incredible. Uh, so here's another story that I discovered by chance. Uh, so I, I said we were inclusive and we included the POWs uh, that were killed. This guy, look at the date, he was killed on VE Day. And he was killed, he actually drowned, trying to save his German captor from drowning. Uh, he'd fallen in, couldn't swim, and uh, he dived in after him and uh, sadly drowned as well but so, so close to freedom and uh, died saving his capture. Says something about them, I think. Uh, dogs on board, yeah, right. So uh, Roy Saunders and his dog. So Roy was uh, with 57 Squadron in the uh, British Expeditionary Force. So this is, uh, so he was stationed in France before the fall of France. Actually, as France was falling, he then had to evacuate himself and his aircraft back to uh, back to Blighty, and uh, in in a in a big hurry, and um, um, they weren't supposed to have their dogs on board, obviously, uh, again against the rules. But many of them did, and Roy certainly did. Um, and uh, in that particular case, though, it was a sort of an extreme circumstance because his alternative was to leave the dog there. And uh, I can probably get, have a guess what the Germans would have done. So, uh, so he took it on board and um, he, he developed an engine problem within a minute or so of taking off and crashed and, and sadly was killed. He was, he was buried locally by the, uh, by the Panzer tank drivers probably. And um, it was only after the war when they, uh, you know, recently they were going around, uh, the British and Americans were going around exhuming bodies and moving them into the big cemeteries, um, grave concentration as the Commonwealth War Graves Commission call it, um, that they came across uh, Roy Saunders' body. And uh, it was unidentifiable because, you know, he's gone six or seven years in the ground. So um, um, it would otherwise have gone into uh, probably Chiloy Cemetery in France, <laughs> I would imagine, um, as a, a, an unknown airman. But in fact, it didn't. And the reason it didn't, because the Germans buried him with his dog. And that's how they identified him. Uh, because when they, uh, when they did a little bit of research of 57 Squadron, um, and they said that this guy was buried with a dog, everybody said, well, that will be Roy Saunders then. Uh, and so it turned out. So it was it was the fact that he was buried with his dog that allowed mm -hmm. him to be identified. Okay, now this is uh, this is an often told story at IBCC, uh, the story of bombsite Bertha, or Dorothy Robson, as she was uh, she was actually called. Uh, she was a graduate, a physics graduate from Leeds University. She hailed from from Yorkshire. Um, and uh, she was an expert in bombsite design, hence the uh, hence the nickname. And um, she used to routinely take her new designs up to Yorkshire squadrons to, to prove them. And she'd gone up on a, on a, on a test flight to, uh, to make sure that it was all set up correctly before the op that night. And again, the, uh, the, uh, the aircraft sadly crashed. She didn't die instantly, uh, but she, she knew she was going to. And she asked that her ashes be, be scattered from, uh, well, some, some sources say another Halifax, but actually I don't think that's true. I think it was, the, as far as I can make out, it, they're actually scattered from a small training uh, aircraft, which was uh, which she sometimes took uh, flying lessons in. Um, uh, but if again, if we weren't inclusive, we wouldn't have this story, and it is a really fascinating one, actually. Um, so that's why we included. 
So that's just a bit of a uh, very quick tour around that those. But um, let me say a little bit about my journey because you know I, I said for a start it started as a as, a, as a quite a mechanical exercise of just typing stuff in, but eventually when I started when when this sort of um, uh, I had this light bulb moment that I could turn it into a, you know a really big living. Um, database that continued to grow forever and um, that's when things changed for me as well because you know um, nobody can go through six years of, of documenting this in the way I have and not be affected by it I mean, it's impossible and um, and, it, and it certainly has had a quite a profound effect on me I think and it, and it took me a while to realize just what that effect really was um, and it actually wasn't until my, my dad died that I realized that it was a grieving process. It, it was, the analogy I always make is, if, if, if somebody close to you dies, it's, it's sort of like a, a big open wound that takes ages to heal. Um, now, this wasn't really like that, but each time you type one in, it's like, like a pinprick, let's say. But by the time you've sustained 58,000 pinpricks, then that's quite a big wound. Um, and and that, that's the best analogy I can make. And, and, and it, has, it is a grieving process for sure. And you, know, you go from this sort of mechanical exercise to, being, to having a connection with them. And in the end, it, can, it becomes almost like a, a spiritual connection with them. And that is how I feel. They are, they are my boys. Um, and I do feel a sort of a responsibility for them now, um, and uh, and that's why actually I'm so delighted of being a trustee because that is just an extension of 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 this um, this responsibility that I feel towards them. Um, it, it it's although it might be a grieving process though it's, it's certainly not negative. Far from it. I am the luckiest person alive. This thing landed in my lap, and um, it's been an amazing journey, and it continues to be. It's, it's like when I come to a set of lights and they're on red and you stop for a moment, then you carry the stories with you and they, one comes into your head and you kind of just think about it for a little while and then the lights go green and you go on your way. And, 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 and that's what it's like. It, it is really incredible to have that store of, 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 of incredible stories in your head. And, and I do feel very very lucky indeed there's no doubt about that so let me just leave you with one statistic i've tried to keep it short on statistics uh, through this talk uh, but i would like to leave you with this number three million so what does it represent well it's the number of life years lost to bomber command there were the average age when they were killed was 23 and um, if you're into statistics, their modal age was 21. Um, so, you know, they had 60, 70, even more lives, uh, years of life left. So if you multiply 58,000 by the, let's say, 60 years that they, uh, that they should have had and were denied, then you get the number 3 million. So that's a very sobering thought, and, and it's the statistic that I'd like to leave you with, and especially today, it being uh, Armistice Day. Um, so um, I think that speaks volumes about, uh, about the sacrifice of, of the guys of Bomber Command. So there you go, that's, that's my talk. Um, if you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to.